background noise. So as I was saying, welcome everybody to the first Borders Book Forum. Can I, can I request those in attendance to mute the microphones because um, we will need to be able to hear the speakers in a second. So thank you very much for everybody for muting the microphones at their end. As I was saying, <laughs> welcome to the first Borders Book Forum on the refugee status of persons with disabilities with author Dr. Stephanie Motz and a panel of stellar discussions that um, we're going to introduce in a second. My name is Violeta moreno Lax. I am Professor of Law and Founding Director of the Borders Centre for the Legal Study of Borders and Migration here at Queen Mary Law School. As I said, we are recording the event for the benefit of those who cannot join us today. Uh, and I hope this is no issue for anybody. Without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to the chair and moderator of the event, Professor Maris Amos from the Human Rights Law Center here at Queen Mary University of London, who will introduce the speakers and the book. So thank you very much everybody for joining and enjoy the session. Thanks very much, Violetta, and uh, welcome to everybody to a Borders Book Forum. And this is the book we are discussing, The Refugee Status of Persons with Disabilities. And I recommend it to you, um, a very detailed analysis of the treatment of persons with disabilities and how that interacts with human rights conventions and how that interacts with the definition of persecution in the Refugee Convention. So uh, we have a, a really rich panel today, a fantastic discussion. And of course, uh, we have the author, Stephanie Mutz, who's here today. And this is uh, a fantastic opportunity to discuss the book, which uh, I think was the subject of her PhD thesis, uh, which she, she received with distinction from the University of Lucerne. And she's now a lecturer there in international migration law. And so she has lots of experience writing and publishing in the fields of human rights, migration law, refugee law. And she's also litigated and appeared before uh, various courts, including the European Court of Human Rights and the UN Human Rights Committee. So she's obviously bringing that incredible practical experience to uh, a much more theoretical and scholarly discussion. So we're, we're also very lucky to be joined today by our discussants and all the way from Australia, we have Professor Michelle Foster, uh, who's very glad not to have had to travel all this, this great distance to London. Uh, Michelle Foster is a professor and the inaugural director of the Peter McMullen Centre on Statelessness at the Melbourne Law School. And she's also published very widely in the field of international refugee law and undertaken consultancy for the UN High Commissioner for Refugees and lots of practical and scholarly experience which she can bring to the discussion. Uh, our second commentator is, is Delia Ferry. And Delia is a professor of law at Maynooth University where she lectures in EU law and international and European disability law. And she's also the director of the postgraduate research program in law and the coordinator of the Maynooth Assisted Living and Learning Institute, which is uh, an interdisciplinary center that promotes person-centered systems, evidence-based policies that empower people across their life course. Our third commentator is Nicolette Sutil, who is, of course, from Queen Mary. She is a postdoc researcher, very recently uh, successfully uh, was awarded her PhD, and she is coordinator of the Borders Centre within our, our School of Law here at Queen Mary. And her research also focuses on the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and implications for, for migrants and refugees. So the format we're going to follow today is we're first going to hear from our book's author, uh, Stephanie, 
Mutz, and uh, she'll, she'll talk for around 15 minutes and introduce us to the, the core concepts in her book. Uh, we'll then have our first comment from Michelle Foster, our second comment from Delia Ferry, our third comment by Nicolette Vesutil. And then Stephanie is going to have uh, an opportunity to, to respond to those comments. And then for the last half hour, we're going to open up to general discussion and questions uh, moderated by myself. So the format for the, the dis discussion, I'll, I'll talk more about closer to the time. But my, my personal preference is that people raise their hands using the function in Zoom and, and then present their question orally. But of course, you can put your question in the chat, but uh, sometimes it gets a little overwhelming if there are uh, lots of questions and lots of discussion going on in the chat as well as, as happening verbally. But we'll, we'll come back to that later. So I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Stephanie Mutz, and she's now going to start with her book presentation. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Maris. Um, and um, thank you also to um, Queen Mary University and Violetta and Nicolette for the invitation and the opportunity to present my book today here. Um, I'm going to share a presentation with you. Um, so. um, now, before I start um, with an introduction to the core concepts of this book, I wanted to quickly set out why, in my opinion, this is a very important topic in international refugee law. Now, the persecution of persons with disabilities is not a new phenomenon. Persons with disabilities were persecuted already in various contexts, and particularly during the Third Reich. It was about a million of persons with disabilities who were euthanized during the Nazi regime, and a further 700,000 who were forcibly sterilized, and 300,000 of which were in concentration camps. So one of the questions I asked myself as I was writing this PhD was, um, why did persons with disabilities not make it into the Refugee Convention as an expressly mentioned group? Um, they are not one of the groups that are set out as possible convention ground, as for instance, religion is. And um, the only explanation I could find was in fact, that at the time of negotiating the Refugee Convention, many of the states um, and the Allied nations fighting Hitler's regime had themselves still forced sterilization programs. And in fact, a lot of the um, um, science that the Nazi eugenics movement was based on came from countries like the UK or the US. And so at the time, there clearly wasn't considered to be a need to, to protect this group. So fast forward about 50 years or more um, to 2006, when finally um, at UN level, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities was signed. And it, this had been called for for several years and not because of course persons with disabilities, they, they were actually already protected by international human rights law. So, um, of course, at the time, it, was, um, it took some time to convince um, states to actually negotiate a new treaty, but the evidence was clear that existing human rights law did not sufficiently protect persons with disabilities. And so eventually, we got the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. It entered into force in 2008. Today, it has 185 ratifications and accessions. This includes the European Union, which has acceded to the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. And this is the first human rights treaty that the EU has acceded to. So that's a quite significant and also, in my view, quite relevant for the further development of EU asylum law um, in accordance with disability rights. And what does the CRPD, um, which is um, shorthand for the convention, what does it actually provide for? Well, of course, like all these group rights treaties at the UN level, it provides, um, it, it specifies different of the experience of human rights abuses from the perspective of persons with disabilities. 
And what I do in the book is I look at what a disability specific refugee definition would look like. How would we um, interpret each of the elements in, in a way that is um, compatible with the CRPD? And I, I do have to say that initially when I started my PhD, I thought I had great ambitions and I thought I was going to write a PhD on all vulnerable groups and refugee, refugee definition as it applies to them. And then um, I met um, Michelle Foster, who's here with us today um, at a conference and I talked to her about my great idea and she said, well, out of all the groups you've mentioned, I think you've got a full PhD just with persons with disabilities and she was totally right when she said that. And so I, I um, changed the topic to that. And actually what I found as I started looking more deeply into the practice of different states was that most states still view persons with disabilities in the asylum context as, as objects of charity, as burdens on the state, particularly on the financial resources, resources of the state. And effectively, and they are applying what is known in the disability rights world, uh, they are employing a, a medical base, a medical model to disability, saying that disability is just a medical issue that you need to treat um, with treatment or um, and, and try to remedy and so on. So um, there was a great need to actually look at all the individual refugee definition elements and to set out how they ought to be interpreted in a way that is compatible with a human rights based model to disability to, to, to see persons with disabilities as rights holders, just like everyone else. Um, I set out here just quickly the different elements of the definition. Um, and um, I did not look in particular at the, the requirement of the person being outside the country of origin. Of course, there can be surplus claims, disabilities that develop while being abroad. Um, and um, I did not particularly examine the well-founded fear element, but I do set out in the introduction how um, the, in, in general, in the case law, it has been accepted that once some persons have cognitive disabilities, for instance, um, they may not be able to formulate a subjective element of the well-founded fear. Now, how did I proceed in, um, in the book? The method I use is I use an evolutionary interpretation of the refugee definition um, in accordance with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, um, Articles 31 and 32. This means that I look at the Refugee Convention as a living instrument in the book and as something that develops in accordance with um, changing international law. And in particular, I adopt a human rights approach to the refugee definition, and specifically the one that is announced by James Hathaway and Michelle Foster in their seminal work, um, Law of Refugee Status. Um, and um, this, the human rights approach, means that um, the refugee definition and its elements do have to be interpreted in accordance with prevailing norms of international law, in particular international human rights law, and in specifically where a human rights treaty has um, received sort of very wide recognition like the CFPD has with 185 ratifications and accessions. Um, it is necessary in, in the light of or it, for a systematic interpretation of the refugee definition to take account of those international human rights norms and provisions in the CRPD. Um, the human rights approach, of course, is something that in different ways and, and forms um, is applied in different countries. Also in the European Union um, asylum law and the qualification directive, it is the basis um, for the definition of persecution by reference, in particular to the European Convention on Human Rights, the European um, sort of equivalent of the ICCPR. Um, but um, for the book, I looked particularly at four countries. I looked at the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand and their case law, specifically because those countries have um, more developed jurisprudence in relation to persons with disabilities. I want to go into a little bit more detail in relation to one of the elements of the refugee definition, the element of serious harm just part of being persecuted. And 
I will just give you here a few examples of what I've looked at in far more detail, of course, in the book, and um, to, to illustrate um, what a disability specific approach would mean. So what I've seen in the case law that is that often um, cases involving forced treatment and forced institutionalization of persons with disabilities did not make it um, to qualify as refugees, um, persons who had claims based on that. And in fact, once one looks at the CRPD, it is very clear that any detention based on disability is not permissible. Um, and the CRPD makes this very clear in its articles 14 and also 19, the right to liberty and the right to live independently and in the community. Um, also in, in, um, in relation to such forced institutionalization, institutionalization, I set it out in the book, I refer variously to the UN Special Rapporteurs on torture, the, the successive ones, in particular Manfred Novak and Juan Mendes, who have looked at the situation of persons with disabilities, for instance, in detention settings. And they've actually said that um, arbitrary or, or unlawful deprivation of liberty based on disability um, inflicts severe pain and suffering and can amount to torture or can constitute torture in itself. And the same is um, the case um, depending on the lay, um, pain and length of institutionalization and the detention conditions. Um, and for forced treatment as well, um, for instance, the use of cage beds, the use of forced electrical convulsive shocks, um, which are used electroshocks as, as, as treatment for certain mental health conditions in, in certain countries. That, when that's used um, forcibly, they will amount to torture when um, the pain is serious. And that's again, according to the UN Special Rapporteur Juan Mendes, same for solitary confinement for persons with mental health issues. Um, it amounts to cruel and human degrading treatment. So actually there is quite a lot already explicitly set out in international human rights law, which should make it very clear that there is serious harm at stake in these situations. And um, just to add to this, of course, in relation to articles 14 and 19, forced treatment also um, articles 15 and 17 of the CRPD are also relevant, 15 in relation to the prohibition of torture and seven in relation to the right to physical, moral and moral integrity. Um, I'm a little bit conscious of time. So the discrimination, the, the discriminatory denial of healthcare is another thing that I observed in the book that often in the case law was not considered um, persecutory. And of course we have Michelle Foster here, the absolute international expert on um, the denial of socioeconomic rights and um, persecution. Uh, but suffice it to say that of course, discriminatory budget allocation and um, choices, for instance, not to provide antiretroviral drugs for HIV patients, but have other medical treatment will um, amount to discriminatory denial of healthcare. And it is a deliberate choice in budget allocation, which is discriminatory and should suffice as serious harm in, depending on, of course, the consequences for the person concerned if she doesn't have access to the required treatment. And the same is um, true for in the denial of inclusive education for children with disabilities. We, we have case law on segregated schooling, for instance, of Roma children, but there it's been clear that that amounts to serious harm. Same applies and we have case law, actually, I have discussed it in the book of um, um, segregated schooling, for instance, of a child with a cerebral palsy. And um, again, that was considered to amount to serious harm. Now, the other elements I will just briefly mention and sort of explain very briefly what I've done in the book. The failure of state protection and internal relocation alternative there, I've in particular, of course, always in, in the context of an um, in evolutionary interpretation according to articles 31 and 32 for the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. I've looked in particular in the CRPD context um, at articles four and five on Article 4 on general obligations of states. So the typical um, provision we have in all human rights treaties where it set out what, state, what obligations states owe in order to implement that convention and Article 5 on equality and non-discrimination. And um, it's just um, perhaps one point that's interesting and I've also um, got this in the book is that of course, even persons in hospitals are state officials. And um, that's also been again stressed by 
the UN Special Rapporteur um, on Torture Manfred Novak. And in, in the case law, I saw that often that was considered private persecution, private act of persecution, but in fact, it should have been state persecution when it is at the hands of um, hospital officials. Causal link, um, I have um, analyzed in, in the book, particularly as concerns the CFPD in the light of the prohibition of discrimination as it set out in um, Article 5 and the definition of reasonable accommodation in Article 2. And what is important here for, to stress is, of course, in certain jurisdictions, there is a requirement of persecutory intent. There is a requirement that you can only be a refugee if the person who harmed you did so maliciously with a malicious intent. And in fact, that is just simply not compatible with a disability specific reading um, of the refugee definition because a lot of forced treatment is, is perhaps well meant, but it is still persecutory. And that's very clear when we look at um, those articles and interpret um, the causal link um, in light of those. Um, the same goes for mixed causes. It is sufficient that disability is just one of the reasons, for instance, why you are being detained and you may well be a danger to yourself or others. But if it is only persons with disabilities who do get detained in those circumstances, that is sufficient. Um, particular social group, I um, refer to Article 1, where um, the dis disability is explained. It is not actually defined in the convention because um, there was um, any um, sort of the idea was to avoid a sort of strict and rigid interpretation which cannot evolve. The idea is that the concept of disability can evolve over time. But um, I set out how this um, is to be interpreted in, in the last chapter of the book. And um, generally speaking, persons with disabilities do qualify as a particular social group in the case law. And to conclude, I just want to, oh, I just want to uh, draw attention to a few decisions um, from UN committees which have come out since the publication of the book and which are, at least in my view, very interesting. And um, two um, decisions from the CRPD committee concerning um, a, a lady from Iraq and a gentleman from Afghanistan with um, mental health issues. And in both cases um, that I've listed here, the committee found a violation of the prohibition of refoulement um, by Sweden's intention to, to send them back to Iraq and Afghanistan because there wouldn't be the required treatment for them available. But I, I do, I, I have to say, I've criticized these elsewhere in the meantime, and there is a little bit of a medical approach still, I think, but still it's a good, it's a good first step. And the CRC committee has just very recently now decided a case of a child with disabilities with a hearing impairment that was supposed to be sent back to Russia there and the treatment was not available. So these are um, the first steps um, now at the level of UN committees where not the very first cases, but the first um, sort of cases now in the light of the CRPD. Um, so in conclusion, it is my view that if we manage to adopt a disability specific interpretation of the refugee definition, it means that finally, also the rights that are set out in the CRPD and that are meant to benefit all persons with disabilities will also benefit those who are in asylum procedures. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much for an uh, amazing presentation. Very interesting, very time, timely, amazing timekeeping as well. So thank you for that. Um, well, we're now going to move on to our first comment from Professor Michelle Foster. Thanks very much. Over to you, Professor Foster. Thank you so much. Well, good morning or good evening, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that some of us meet today on the lands of the traditional custodians, which in my case is the lands of the Wurundjeri people, and I acknowledge and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. Well, I have to say it's a genuine delight to have been invited to speak at this event today. As Stephanie mentioned, I first met her, I think it was almost 10 years ago now at a conference at which time she was, as she said, developing her ideas for her doctoral research. And it's been just an absolute pleasure and a thrill to watch her eyes, ideas develop and culminate in this really impressive piece of work. So in my remarks today, I'd like to comment on the timeliness and significance of the book and then reflect on its implications for refugee policy and scholarship. So why is this work so timely and so necessary? Well, it seems extraordinary that it has taken so long, 70 years from the inception of the Refugee Convention, 
for the protection of persons with disabilities within refugee law to receive such close attention. As Stephanie observes in her book, and as she's mentioned, no attention at all was paid to this issue by the drafters of the Refugee Convention. Yet when we consider the context, and in particular the normative context of the Convention's origins, it's perhaps not so surprising. At the time of drafting the Refugee Convention, the modern system of international human rights law was in its infancy. The seminal Universal Declaration of Human Rights was the sole source of guidance on universal human rights. And indeed, the importance of this instrument is reflected in its inclusion in the preamble to the Refugee Convention. Now, this inclusion has been said to evince an intention that the Refugee Convention was part of the context of evolving international human rights norms. And its inclusion also provides insight into the object and purpose of the Refugee Convention, so as to influence the interpretation of key convention terms. Yet when we consider the Universal Declaration, we immediately observe a lacuna. The UDHR does not include disability in its prohibition on discrimination. Indeed, the only mention of disability is in Article 25 in relation to the right to social security in the event of, amongst other things, disability. So persons with disability then were not, at least clearly and unequivocally, conceived of as rights holders in international law. Now we know that the UDHR was translated into binding form in the subsequent treaties dealing with civil and political rights on the one hand and economic and social rights on the other. And together, the UDHR with the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the ICCPR, and its equivalent in economic and social rights, the ICESCA, the so-called International Bill of Rights, have operated as an important source of inspiration for refugee judges interpreting the core terms in refugee law. Yet when we look at the ICCPR, again, we see that neither of the non-discrimination provisions in that instrument, namely Articles 2 and 26, explicitly mention disability. Hence, while the human rights approach to interpreting the refugee definition has been well entrenched in jurisprudence for decades, it wasn't really until the advent of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability that the human rights approach could be invoked in a straightforward manner so as to include persons with disability. But at the same time, of course, the CRPD does not merely apply core human rights principles to persons with disability. I mean, it does that. But we might also say that its stronger focus on positive obligations on states, especially in relation to social and economic rights, challenges the boundaries of the refugee definition. In particular, Article 5.3's obligation on states to, quote, take all appropriate steps to ensure that reasonable accommodation is provided in order to promote equality and eliminate discrimination means, according to the CRPD committee, that reasonable accommodation is an intrinsic part of the immediately applicable duty of non-discrimination in the context of disability. So the extent to which a failure to provide such accommodation could amount to serious harm and thus persecution remains an open-ended question. So in this context, it is evident how timely and necessary Stephanie's intervention has been. She has thoughtfully and insightfully considered these questions in detail through a comprehensive and meticulous examination of the case law in light of principle. As she observes in the book, persons with disabilities, to quote, experience many forms of persecution which are not commonly accepted as a basis for refugee status. So she explores, as we've already heard in her wonderful presentation tonight, she explores the extent to which reference to the CRPD in the refugee law context could lead to a disability specific reading of serious harm and of course other elements of the refugee definition. She concludes that where a person will be returned to a country in which her rights under the CRPD will be violated, the situation in all but the most trivial instances is highly likely to amount to persecution. So in my remaining time, I will just highlight two key implications of this groundbreaking work. I think the first, which will be obvious from the comments I've made so far, is that it makes a genuine contribution to the understanding and the body of refugee law doctrine. Refugee law judges, whether at the tribunal or judicial level, often rely on external sources of guidance for interpreting the terms of the Refugee Convention. Indeed, the cross-fertilisation of ideas across jurisdictional boundaries is a striking feature of refugee law decision-making. In order to bring cross-jurisdictional trends and developments to light, academic work is often very influential and heavily relied upon in refugee law. Yet, until this book emerged, such guidance was largely lacking.
Likewise, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees guidelines on international protection, now numbering 13 sets of guidelines, has scarcely filled this lacuna. So while there remain many gaps and uncertainties in the case law to date, this book provides a principled basis to guide and develop refugee law into the future. And in addition, by making the connection between the CRPD and refugee status determination, I think it will inspire other important developments such as the recognition of the concept of non-reformal in relation to the CRPD. And in fact, Stephanie, your citation of those recent cases really underpins that point. But the second point I want to make, which is sort of departing a little bit from just focusing on the refugee definition, is I think the book also inspires us to ensure that we retain a focus on persons with disabilities as rights holders at international law when we consider other aspects of refugee law and policy. And I think here we could consider a wide range of issues, but I'll just highlight a particular noteworthy issue warranting further research and inquiry. And it relates to the renewed international focus on cooperation in the context of refugees, and particularly on the need to foster refugee self-reliance. Now, in this respect, one of the key objectives of the Global Compact on Refugees is described as follows. To foster inclusive economic growth for host communities and refugees, states and relevant stakeholders will contribute resources and expertise to promote economic opportunities, decent work, job creation, and entrepreneurship programs for host community members and refugees, including women, young adults, older persons, and persons with disability. And I think it's testament to the effective advocacy by the International Disability Alliance and others that disability is reflected st so strongly in the global compact. Yet it's not sufficient for us to be satisfied with the number of times disability is mentioned in an instrument like the global compact. In order to fulfill this aim of fostering inclusive economic growth, it's imperative that research is undertaken as to existing programs and practice and their efficacy in order to ensure that these programs are carried, that are carried out under the auspices of the Global Compact can be designed and implemented in a meaningful and context appropriate manner. Interestingly, warning bells have been rung in relation to some aspects of the Global Compact, which warrant attention for us as people concerned with the rights of persons with disabilities. In the context of the right to work, for example, scholars such as Costello have raised concerns that the GCR suggests an unmooring of refugee protection from law and normative commitments. Accordingly, we must continue to insist upon compliance with clear commitments rooted in human rights. Now, I think given that disability has only recently been properly and fully understood in human rights terms, we must be careful not to allow such an unmooring in the context of refugee policy. So in short, this important and vital contribution promises to have an enormous impact on refugee law doctrine, as I've described, but I think it will also influence uh, future policy and will undoubtedly inspire future research in the field. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today and warmest congratulations, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Foster, for your comments. Uh, we're now going to hear from Professor Delia Ferry, from Maynooth University, thank you. So thank you, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with you today. And I would like to thank Professor Morella Lax for her invitation. Um, I must say that I thoroughly enjoyed reading uh, Stephanie's book, which I found extremely informative, thought provoking and rather innovative. And in this, in this respect, I'd like to echo what uh, Professor Foster already said, that this book is really um, filling a gap in the literature and has the potential to influence uh, uh, future policies, uh, not only refugee policies, but also broadly speaking, disability policies. Um, the book confirms that refugee law is an area in which uh, the CRPD has had so far very limited influence and that's the case also at the European Union level in which uh, the CRPD has had quite um, a widespread influence in different areas of law but not refugee law. And it also confirms, as, as Stephanie mentioned earlier in our presentation, the persistence of the medical model but on the other end, the book also opens up new scenarios um, as the great merit uh, to shed a light on the potential for the CRPD uh, to really illuminate the 
um, interpretation of the refugee convention and, and actually to interpret the notion of refugee in a manner that aligns to the COPD and embeds its, its uh, transformative value. So I'm, I'm very glad for the opportunity and I, I, I had a lot of thoughts uh, uh, that, that came out uh, reading the books, but I would like to mention, well, first of all, two general strengths, uh, in my opinion, of the book. Again, I will echo some of, of the thoughts that have already been expressed by Professor Fursler, and then I'd like to go on, on, on more um, disability specific issues. So, well, again, uh, the the innovative aspect of the book is really uh, something that needs to be reiterated. Uh, when we look, at, we look at disability scholarship in particular, we see that there is a dearth of contributions. Uh, um, and uh, in 2011, uh, Clara Spremer, that you also cite in your book, already highlighted that disability may interact with the asylum in various ways. And yet, after her contribution, that was an article published in Disability and Society, we see that there's not, there have not been many works dealing with the intersection between refugee law and disability law, or uh, indeed um, about the experience of refugees with disabilities. So th there have been some contribution, but really we can count them on our fingers, on the fingers of our end. Uh, and so the book is really important in that it fills such a gap in the literature. The second one, the, the second strength that I would like to highlight is the methodological approach. I, uh, I think that the uh, use of evolutionary interpretation is really um, important and I, I'm aware that evolutionary interpretation is a contested topic in international law. It has been subject to debate. There are books. Uh, there, is, there was a new collection published uh, uh, in 2020 on the merits and the merits of uh, evolutionary interpretation. But if, I feel that the way in which you articulate the need for an evolutionary interpretation and a human rights approach is extremely sound and uh, um, anchored to the Vienna Convention on the Law of the Treaties. And as a matter of fact, if we look at the practice of international courts, in many respects, evolutionary interpretation has been the practice. Um, recently, even the Inter-American Court on Human Rights has insisted on the need uh, for evolutionary interpretation, asserting especially that when generic terms or general terms are used, there is an obligation to um, interpret those terms in light of the evolution of the legal system. And in this perspective, it's, it's important that uh, you use the CRPD as part of this evolutionary trend of human rights law. Um, one aspect that I also really appreciated is the engagement with case law, which I think is, is very important. I, I was a bit curious about the reason that prompted you to, to select the jurisdictions. You mentioned that those are very interesting. And in fact, the cases that you mentioned are extremely, extremely interesting, but I'd like to know more, and maybe you can tell us a bit more about why you decided to focus on those specific jurisdiction. Uh, I saw that you mentioned also an Irish case, the EMS case um, was the end of the book, but there are, as a matter of fact, other jurisdictions that present interesting practices. But moving on to the disability uh, issues, well, first of all, um, I, I really welcome the fact that in line with the CRPD, you embrace a very broad conception of disability that encompasses conditions like HIV uh, and albinism. Albinism is quite obvious in the sense that the CRPD committee has engaged with this uh, particular condition as a form of disability um, in, in cases that you cite at the, at the end of the book, uh, uh, X versus Tanzania and Epsilon versus Tanzania. 
But with regard to HIV, there, has been, there is still a discussion, there has been a discussion, and it's very important that to embrace that broad conception that, in my opinion, really captures the essence of the CRPD, of this non-concept, the non-definition or open concept, so to speak, um, and that, that focus, focuses on the interaction between the impairment or the individual condition and external barriers. I was maybe a bit surprised in the book not to see, uh, a, uh, let's say, a more extended, extensive discussion of the models of disability. At the beginning, you mentioned the social model. You mentioned, of course, the medical model. You contrast those two models. But I, was, I was a bit surprised because um, disability lawyers and actually those who, who, who deal with disability and, and disability studies uh, have engaged quite a lot on, on those models, the interaction between those models. The terminology also is, is quite um, diverse. For instance, I, I myself, together with Broderick, um, suggested that the CRPD embraces the social contextual and a model or understanding of disability, it moves away from the pure social model, which is something that also Kayes and French uh, suggest in their um, quite famous article published in, in back in 2008. So that was something that uh, um, I found interesting. And uh, on the one end, this uh, uh, broad concept of disability that you embrace, you put forward and uh, as also a key uh, concept that can open up a more disability oriented uh, approach to the refugee definition. And on the other end, uh, less engagement with the, with the models per se. Um, this also uh, triggers in, 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 in what you then uh, discuss in chapter six in the interpretation of a particular social group. And uh, uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, we can't rely only on social perception. And while this is true, it's also important that this doesn't uh, distract us from considering disability as a product of social barriers. Um, you mentioned already um, in the book that uh, the, uh, the UNCHR mentioned the combination of these approaches, so uh, the protective characteristic and the social perception as, as a way forward. You mentioned that, and then you reflect a bit more on the consequences of the social perception and I, I find that the social perception, if used correctly and if combined correctly in the, the way in which, uh, for instance, the CRPD looks at stigma and prejudice as a barrier, can, can be powerful, can actually extend the notion of, of, of refugee. And in my opinion, uh, for instance, the, the, in the case of uh, Kocherova, I'm not sure my pronunciation is correct here, but in this case, the reference to common experiences really um, is uh, important in the sense that merges the experience, the individual experience with the social perception that make those experiences. Um, moving from the concept of disability to the innovative value of the CRPD rights that you highlight at various junctures. I would like to, again, to, to praise uh, your book because it really captures the transformative and innovative values of the CRPD rights, which um, are quite transformative in the way they are written. Um, and you also highlight uh, an aspect that is very, very important. So the fact that there is a blurred distinction between civil political rights and social, economic and social um, um, and cultural rights. So this distinction is rather blurred and you highlight that at various junctures in the book. 
I'm conscious of the time, so I just want to uh, mention one final aspect that I think um, your book highlights, and this is the importance uh, of recognizing discriminatory attitudes that persons with disabilities face. And uh, I think that the conception of discrimination, a broad conception of discrimination can really open up to a more disability uh, specific interpretation of uh, the notion of refugee. And I would connect that to the concept of inclusive equality and the model of inclusive equality. You don't engage very much with that concept, but this concept I think that really can, can be a sort of passport too, as well when we look at all the elements uh, um, of the definition of refugee, because the inclusive equality model that the CRPG committee has put forward uh, include a fair redistributed dimension to address socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, it provides a recognition dimension to combat stigma, stereotyping, prejudice, violence, and to recognize the dignity of human beings and their intersectionality. It has also a participative dimension to reaffirm the social nature of people with disabilities as members of the society and an accommodating dimension that really connects to the duty to provide reasonable accommodation in all ambits of life. And I think that this is the key really to um, interpret all the um, the part of the definition of refugees. And on a final note, I really want to thank you for, for this wonderful book. I enjoyed reading that and I want to congratulate for such a fantastic publication, which I think will really influence future studies and the intersection between disability law and refugee law. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Ferry. Uh, we now have our last speaker, our last commentator, Dr. Sutil, and so I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marys. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's such a privilege to be here today and to be part of this discussion uh, on a book, which, as everyone has outlined and where I can only echo my sentiments, uh, it's such a rich contribution to the field. Not just international refugee law, but you have managed quite a feat because it is a contribution to two distinct fields so far, but where you have really provided us with a blueprint as to how we can reconcile these two fields that for so long have been growing in relative isolation. So thank you, Stephanie. I wanted to break down my comments into three broad points, which I hope we can then continue to build on in the discussion. The first one is one which has been mentioned, but which I would like to re reiterate because I do believe in the importance of your book's contribution as countering the invisibility of refugees within uh, um, refugees as persons with disabilities in both the international refugee law framework and the international refugee law framework. And as has been mentioned in a way, it couldn't be any other way, right? At the inception of the Refugee Convention, disability was a forgotten issue, not just when it came to refugee issues of refugee protection, but equally so when it came to the international human rights law framework, which was still very much in its infancy at the time. But whilst that might have been maybe um, not excusable, but whilst it might have been understandable at that point in time, it is very difficult to understand and to accept that, that the extent to which that continues to be the case today. And um, Maria Pisani and Sean Greg have this wonderful article where they bring together the issues relating to disability and forced migration. And they highlight, well, the connections, and I quote, have only infrequently been made with the implication that those working in disability remain unaware of and uneducated in migration, and those working in migration remain uninformed about and uneducated in disability. And I think after this book, people will really not have an excuse, right? <laughs> not that they should have so far, but 
in um, the way in which you have combined extensive rigor in your doctrinal deconstruction of the refugee definition, the refugee definition and combined it with the seminal concepts of the CRPD, you really have uh, forged a path that we can take forward and that has um, value beyond the fields of international, um, of the refugee, simply the disability specific uh, application of the refugee definition. Um, Professor Ferry earlier mentioned Clara Strymer's article and how in 2011, you, uh, we had, uh, but we had her explaining, well, you know, at the time of the recast qualification directive, we kind of, there was, a, there was insufficient lobbying that justifies somehow the absence of disability in the recast qualification directive. But as you yourself note um, in, in your book, well, this is, this is, we're not only talking about four or five years after the, the adoption of the CRPD. Last year's, or well, the 2020 European Pact on Migration and Asylum omitted any form of consideration on um, references to disability, and which to me um, comes up as a, quite an egregious omission. Um, Professor Ferry also mentioned the issues, and you yourself, Stephanie, mentioned the issue with the European Asylum Framework. And I think your book does give us the tools that we can use to really see not just how uh, disability is invisibilized or is not mentioned in European asylum law, but it can also give us the tools to deconstruct the extent to which it is those laws in themselves that actually preclude refugees with disabilities from enjoying their rights on an equal basis with others. Um, on, that, uh, on that note, one thing which really struck me and which I think is mainstreamed in the methodology that you apply in your book, it really reflects the CRPD ethos because you privilege the person with disabilities who happens to be a refugee, you privilege their status as a person. Yes, we are speaking about refugees, but in somehow presenting their starting point as that CRPD understanding of the individual with disabilities entitled to full and equal enjoyment of all human rights, we have um, somehow flipped the, that uh, privileging of the status assumption that somehow when it comes to refugees, what counts as serious harm in other fields needs to meet even higher thresholds. And I think that is something that deserves to be unpacked, something which you have done, um, chapter three in particular, where you speak of serious harm and you draw upon the various CRPD rights. It is something which has implications be beyond simply the refugee definition, but as you've also mentioned in the non, uh, also in the non uh, refoulement context. And on that note, I wanted to say a few words about why um, your, um, your, bring, your reconciliation of the CRPD framework with the interpretation of serious harm can be so important in the non refoulement context as well. Also, because that is uh, my particular area of interest. And I must say that when I read your book for the first time, my initial reaction was, well, couldn't you have published this five years ago when I was starting <laughs> and trying to come to terms and come to grips with how these two fields speak to each other? But one of the things which you highlight and you've also highlighted in your presentation is the importance of understanding harm meted out to persons with disabilities as serious harm. And for the purposes of international refugee law, just as much as it is for international human rights law. And in particular, the denial or the absence of available medical, the unavailability of medical treatment is something that you highlight as particularly important and as a disability specific form of harm in itself. And you also reconcile it with the need that it is not just a treatment that has to be available, but that must also be adequate. And in terms of adequate medical treatment, that is in conformity with the international human rights standards that the CRPD has established, particularly for mental health care. The one issue that I would see, or rather where I am not, where I think we need to um, 
recognize that as much in as much as the CRPD is unequivocal as what is unacceptable when it comes to mental health care, for example, forced institutionalization and non-compulsory, uh, sorry, non-consensual medical treatment, I think it's important to also acknowledge that in the wider international human rights law framework, this is still an unsettled field. And Martins and Gurbai refer to it as the Geneva impasse, right? Where you have key actors saying, no, this is torture. This is not just um, a human rights violation, but this is torture, it's absolute. There is nothing else you can say about it. But then contrasting it with others who within, still within the UN framework, within the human rights framework saying, well, this is a violation, but in some cases it might be justifiable and still using those old arguments of best interests and necessity to justify this uh, this approach. So my question in that case would be, well, how do we reconcile that, right? How is the refugee decision, the refugee status uh, adjudicator, or how is the practitioner going to reconcile that, um, that particular impasse, that particular unsettled nature of that area of law? Um, I would be happy to discuss this further. I'm not going to go into it over here, but I think that is something to, um, to that that's that we we can bring out. Of course, in the non-reformon context in Europe, I think your book has the potential to really call into question the way that the supranational, um, so both the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice continue to interpret non refoulement claims. You have, of course, mentioned the CRPD committee's approach and how even that sometimes is redolent of a medical model. But if that's the case, then, oh my goodness, where are we <laughs> in Europe with cases like Papozhvili, where, yes, we celebrate that the door has widened and people say, well, yes, we've moved somehow. It, for some, it seems as if we've solved the situation. Whereas um, I, I'm, I'm, I think you'd agree, given the thrust of your book, well, exceptionality remains a huge issue that fails to recognize the development of the CRPD. Um, I... Of course, there is a lot more than we can say, but I would like to conclude by, by outlining or highlighting that the story of the CRPD is one of hope, right? It is certainly one of struggle and one uh, of a huge segment of the world's population taking uh, a very long time before they got final, uh, uh, full and equal recognition of their rights. But at least, even if in implementation, there is still much to be done, in international human rights law, we got there. I think we need to explore how that change, that struggle that ultimately culminated in the CRPD can also be translated into improved and effective rights protection for refugees. You have laid down the gauntlet, I think very clearly and very wonderfully, and it is now up to you and all of us to implement that and to try to see how we can improve upon it and actually make it happen in practice. So, Thank you very much. And I will leave some time for the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. So I'm going to invite Dr. Motz to reply. Uh, just a brief reply, five minutes or so. Um, over to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And thank you all for all your comments um, and the feedback. Um, that's just been very, very inspiring for me as well. And um, I, I will try to take these points just briefly in turn. And the first I would like to um, refer to is a point that was made both by you, Nicolette, and by you, Delia, and um, that's in relation to what's out there um, in disability theory, how much more debate there, there is, of course, as well. And um, that's absolutely right. And but there were limits to what was um, what I could do in, in the context of this. Get, get, moving again, feeling less constricted, body and mind, potentially. So yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad also that you're glad there's that you're powered on through. There is someone who's unmuted. Can I just ask everybody yeah. to mute? If they could, thank you. Brilliant. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, there is there is so much more that needs to be discussed in the context of disability theory, and I'm very aware of that. Um, and there were, I mean, clearly I am, I'm coming with a refugee law background. I am a refugee lawyer. And um, there is 
of course, much more that I brought to this book here. But as Nicolette said, I mean, the aim was really to, to find a bridge between these two separate areas of law and, and to show how they can actually converge and, and, and um, uh, be mutually um, reinforcing. So, um, but yes, I completely agree that there is so much more that would need to be discussed and that is uh, where, where research is also required. What um, I would like to go to next is, um, and, and to, to, is the, the jurisdictions, of course, that I chose. Well, it was the ones where I found there was a rich body of um, case law of practice about two to 10 years ago when I, um, when I first started on this endeavor. Um, but of course, I mean, it would be brilliant to do this in relation to all countries. I have done it also um, in, in national publications in relation to Switzerland and case law here. But of course, um, yes, there is much more. And of course, there are linguistic um, um, limits to what I could um, examine. That's that's for sure. But I could have examined more states. Um, but yeah, there, there were, I had to set a framework for this study. And then. Um, looked at those which have the richest body. Uh, but what um, I would like to go next is the point about a particular social group there. I would just like to clarify because this is quite important to me and that maybe this is just my refugee lawyer's hat. But the thing is in refugee law, the social perception approach is just very often very problematic. And that's why I'm very critical of it in the book because what it, it has tended to lead to is it's the exclusion of people from refugee status. So, um, and actually the cumulative approach, which UNHCR um, has, uh, not UNHCR actually, the UNHCR not, does not, the EU qualification directive uses a, a cumulative, cumulative approach to the particular social group criterion. Um, UNHCR actually uses an alternative approach, which has been misinterpreted meaning, as meaning a, a cumulative approach. Um, and actually the cumulative approach is, is, is certainly a dangerous one because that's even more exclusive. Um, ideally, and, and I am, and I propagate this in the book, is it, we'd have a, um, an alternative approach where we have both the personal characteristics approach and the social perception approach. And if you meet one or the other, then you are a refugee. Um, I mean, you have to meet the particular social group criterion. Um, so that's what, what my view is, and that's what I also um, uh, really uh, um, advance in the book. And yes, of course, the social, I see the point that the social perception approach is actually much more important from the disability rights movement perspective, because it is much more about the social barriers. It's much more about what society, how society perceives you, rather than you being different from others, everybody's different. So, um, so I, I totally see that point. I, I think there I really have the refugee lawyer's hat and see what it has meant in the case law. Um, but I would never um, say that the social perception approach should be completely abolished. I just, I propagate that both, both should be um, valid um, alternative, as alternative bases. Um, now, one point um, which um, I think Nicolette and, and Michelle, you, you've both made is that of course, um, the invisibility of refugees is, um, is much more widespread than just in relation to the refugee definition. And I entirely agree with you that there's so much more that needs to be done in relation to procedural rights in the asylum system, in relation to reception conditions. We see it now here in Switzerland, and I'm sure in other countries in Europe as well, with the Ukrainian deaf refugees, where there are a lot of refugees with disabilities. And our reception conditions, our system is not, there, there is just, no accommodation for persons with disabilities. And now that there are so many people, there's even less of that condition, but even before there wasn't any. And so there are really so many points where, where we still, I think this needs to stay high on the agenda and there, there is definitely a need for more research and more work and also at the policy level um, for the rights of persons with disabilities to become a reality in the entire asylum system. I entirely agree. And I think just to conclude, um, because this is really, um, yeah, a sore point for me as well. Yes, um, Nicolette, I agree with you that, um, and this is a European lawyer's um, concern, but the European Court of Human Rights case law in this context is just awful. And um, Papushvili is awful. The more recent Grand Chamber judgment in Savran against Denmark is absolutely <laughs> horrific and makes it even worse. They have uh, 
they, they really um, apply a medical model to disability in the worst of its senses. And um, yes, I'm, I'm waiting for the day when the European Court of Human Rights will finally take note um, that there are actually human rights for persons with disabilities and they also apply in the reform more context. Um, and then, yeah, I'm certainly working towards that myself as well. So um, those are my remarks. Thank you all very much for your comments. Um, and yes, and now I'd give it back to you, um, Professor Amos, for the discussion. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, so please, if you have any questions, um, you, can, you can raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. Now, while we're waiting for questions, I would also like to say that you can purchase the book. And I think Nicolette has a flyer that she can also put in the chat. In one minute. Okay, so I have one question so far. Um, Mukesh, would you like to ask your question and put on your camera if you can? Uh, sure, yep, camera. Great, thank you. Uh, right, uh, I'm new to all this refugee and disability issues, uh, except on a personal basis. So one of the clarifications I'd like is, what is the status of new disabilities in, ref in the refugee status, i.e. disabilities that are caused by the refugee situation itself, as opposed to disabilities that exist before the refugee situation came about? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Great, thank you. That's an interesting question. Um, so refugee status as a result, um, a new situation, um, a disability status. So Stephanie, would you like to, to have some comments on that first? Sure, and I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps not 100% sure I, I know what you mean. So you mean when you say caused by the refugee situation, do you mean caused by war, for instance, something like that, or? Uh, yes, for example, if you uh, have a person who has been subjected to torture. Now, that is clearly a, 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 a situation with persecution. However, that torture can lead to disabilities where the persecution itself may not be allow, uh, allowed as a refugee situation or status, but certainly the disabilities following on from that torture can be may or might be treated separately. Yes. Uh, is that clear? <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's very clear. Thank you. Um, yes, I mean, that's a, that's a brilliant question. And of course, one that's um, highly relevant in the refugee law context, because um, the vast majority of people have, um, have some sort of trauma and very often, and there are ensuing mental health issues because of that. And um, especially, yes, torture victims. Um, it's a well known um, point. Um, absolutely. If, it, if, if there is um, Either, I mean, in, in my view, even um, on the basis of illness, there may be issues, um, or if there is a bit disability, certainly that is for me just as relevant um, to the refugee definition um, as a pre existing disability. There is some case law, I mean, there is one case from the Court of Justice of the European Union concerning a Tamil man who did not fear persecution on, upon return to Sri Lanka, but he had been tortured in the past. He had serious mental health issues as a result and the right to rehabilitation of torture victims, which is also guaranteed under the Convention Against Torture under Article 14 was also considered by the court. And um, if, so what the, what the court, the Court of Justice of the European Union said is if there's a deliberate withholding or denial of medical treatment to torture victims, that um, amounts to, to serious harm or yeah. Um, it was in the context of reformant, but um, it's sort of similar, I guess. And there are now um, cases also from the Committee Against Torture to Dublin removals from Switzerland to Italy concerning torture victims where the medical treatment was not available and that was considered a violation of the reformant prohibition, prohibition of torture in, in Article 3 capped. 
um, as well as in one case, Article 14. Um, so there are developments in relation to, in particular, that. And um, I'm, I'm also not sure um, it, to what extent, for instance, the cases from the CFPD committee that I've um, cited at the end of my presentation, those ones, um, it, it's not clear, so I remember from the statement of facts, whether these were pre-existing mental health conditions that they had. They both had, if I remember correctly, post-traumatic stress disorder, and then added features, psychotic features, or some suspicion of paranoid schizophrenia um, in addition. But um, also there, um, um, yeah, the issue was not that clear. But I mean, the question always is in these cases, when you come to the refugee definitions, is of course, you, you need the causal nexus. So in terms of reformor, I think it's, it's reformor prohibition. Um, it's, it's more straightforward in the context of the refugee definition. Um, you would have to look at the situation in the country of origin and, and find um, a causal nexus in terms of, for instance, the absence of treatment and um, um, conditions in which the person can actually lead, uh, enjoy their rights, human rights, and, and, and lead um, a, a decent life, um, whether there is a link, um, a, a causal link. But um, yes, yeah, so depending on, on the circumstances of the case, but I would say um, very much um, that that qualifies. I don't know if anybody else would perhaps like to add to that. I think I think uh, I think that's that's covered the question. Uh, Mukesh, is that okay? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, obviously, there's hours of discussion we could have about this, so uh, <laughs> I think we ought to leave it there for the moment. All I right, think Violet has actually got a further comment on it, however. And there was also another hand up briefly. Wilfred, did you want to ask that question? Yes, uh, it's sort of like a follow-on or an add-on to that particular question as well. Um, I'm also, you know, on a personal interest of mine that looking at uh, PTSD and anxiety, uh, the CRPD sort of like gives us a, a rough definition that is got to be a long-term disability. So in terms of uh, conditions uh, or rather disabilities such as PTSD or anxiety, where it might be short-term for a while, but then it's something that could be triggered by either the threat of being sent back home to your to your home country. How does uh, or how should we view this as uh, as lawyers trying to present a case for you know trying to highlight the impact of this particular disability, especially where they are being sent back to a country where they might not have the medical expertise to treat conditions uh, or disabilities such as PTC, PTSD. Uh, Nicolette, would you like to answer uh, on, on this question? I know it's a particular specialism of yours. I don't want to put you on the spot, but if that was something. No, of course. And nice to see you, Wilfred. Um, nice to see you. <laughs> I think, w w I mean, when it comes to the long term nature, of uh, an impairment, that is something that, so the CRPD in its definition or it's a non-definition, right, of disability, it refers to an impairment that is of a long-term nature. And sometimes that brings up questions or has brought up questions as to whether some form of transient mental health problems are included within that or not. The CRPD committee itself has clarified that the difference between an illness and a disability is one of, um, is not necessarily a difference in kind. So by virtue of chronicity or by virtue of um, an impairment, an ailment that can occur over um, um, that uh, might be more than just a few weeks, let's say, or a few months, that could potentially qualify as a disability. I also know that um, Professor Ferry, in fact, has written quite a lot on this, uh, the definition of disability in the EU context, and has looked precisely at how, at cases where the Court of Justice, for the purposes of EU law, have uh, alluded to the fact that this applying uh, a definition of disability that would insist on a long-term impairment would be disabling in itself. I think, Wilfred, you're right that fluctuating <clears throat> mental health conditions pre present an additional issue to the CRPD and to how this can be integrated in the 
uh, in the migration and asylum field, precisely because mental health conditions are misunderstood in general, right? So you are facing the barrier of a misunderstanding of what the what mental health is all about, but I don't think it is an insurmountable barrier. If anything, I would say that as we have seen, a CRPD compliant definition would most certainly allow for also those form of uh, different kinds of impairments to qualify for protection as a person with disability. Thank you. Uh, we have another question uh, from Mike. Mike Higgins, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Good morning. Um, first of all, I think I should preface what I have to say briefly with uh, an apology and that I don't have a legal background. My engagement with this topic has been very much from an activist's disabled people's point of view. And uh, that's, where I'm, that's where I'm coming from in a sense. I have campaigned and do continue to campaign for disabled asylum seekers in the UK, uh, but don't pretend to have a, a, a anything like the grasp of um, international uh, jurisprudence and uh, of, of uh, the case law that clearly is present in today's meeting. So please forgive any errors. My question really was stimulated by the comments about the interplay between the medical and the social in this context. And if I may very briefly, I want to illustrate my question with an example. The, 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 um, uh, the gentleman I want to talk about was um, uh, fled to the UK um, whilst the whilst, whilst um, the Taliban were not running Afghanistan, he had a physical impairment and he had a mental health condition, but was deported because he had he faced no real prospects of persecution at the time when he was uh, sent back to Afghanistan. Subsequently, of course, uh, the Taliban have taken over there, and he's now got a fled back to Iran and is seeking again to come back to the UK. However, the information he's been given is that again he doesn't face a well-founded uh, fear of persecution. Now, the reality is that he was not allowed to work and neither were his two uh, female children, uh, who, are, who are adults, by the way, they're trained doctors, but neither of them, or none of them are being allowed to work in Afghanistan. So he wasn't going to be killed, I don't think, um, but he was, he obviously had to go because he couldn't, uh, he couldn't um, survive where he was. Uh, actually, his children are facing similar problems in Iran, but not to the same extent. However, what other, the question I have is about the social context. If we look here, not at the intention of the Taliban or anyone else around um, uh, persecuting him or his children, but the reality is that for him as a disabled, physically impaired man with mental health condition, he is not going to survive very long in Iran the way he currently is. Um, so really we have to bring in the social dimension there, do we not, when trying to argue the case for him to have a genuine um, a status as a refugee and I'd be interested really within the context of the book that obviously I suppose I have a supplementary too is the book available accessibly I'm a blind person so I can't read the print version but I'm hoping it is available electronically uh, that's, a, that's a kind of second sneaky question but my main question is um, bearing all that in mind is there some arguments for room for arguing uh, the extension of the the social model of disability into the sphere of uh, considering refugee law sorry the question was so long Thank you. Uh, which of our panelists uh, would like to, to answer that? Uh, Professor Ferry, uh, Professor Foster, I haven't given you an opportunity to answer a question yet. I'm happy to jump in if you like. I mean, Stephanie, you probably also have some views here. Um, I think, uh, thanks very much, Mike, for the question. Uh, I, mean, I don't think we had time to sort of get into the intricate details of the refugee definition, uh, but Stephanie did touch on the notion that a person needs to show, in order to be a refugee, you need to show you have a well-founded fear of being persecuted for a particular reason, and hence the focus on social group. But what I think Stephanie didn't have time to go into was this causal link, you know, that the persecution or the serious harm needs to be linked to the convention ground. And the question is, how do we establish that ground? There's, I think you did touch on this question of, do you need to show that there's an intention to persecute? Um, and whether you have to show that the, you know, the persecutor is aware of this person's condition and therefore is persecuting on that basis. For those jurisdictions that take quite a strict view of that, that there needs to be a link that's shown by intention, then that sort of social context is really hard to draw in because there's sort of this disproportionate focus on who is going to be, there has to be an actor of persecution and you have to sort of be able to examine their motivations. But I think where there's been case law, it's been more what I might say is progressive, looking at a more sort of contextual approach, what we might call the predicament approach, where you say, why is the person in that predicament? And then the answer may be, well, let's look at the context and let's then looking at the context, 
makes it clear that the person is at risk because of their disability and it doesn't matter whether anyone's intending to harm them in that way. That's for refugee law. Of course, the benefit of the sort of more general complementary protection regime that has been discussed, particularly by Nicolette, is that you don't need that connection to a convention ground. So you're really just looking at what is the predicament of this person? Are they at risk of a sufficiently serious level of harm on return? And if yes, then those non-reformal obligations are activated. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's you've really sort of focused in on what is probably one of the most difficult aspects of establishing these claims, I think, in international law. So not a very definitive response, but just to say it, it's complex and it depends on the jurisdiction. Did you want to add anything, anyone else, Stephanie? Yeah, we'll, we'll just we're just um, we've got seven minutes left so I'm going to try and deal with the uh, Philippa would you like to ask your question thank you and thanks to all the panelists it's been a really interesting discussion um, my question um, is a, a little bit different to the earlier questions I'm um, wondering do any of the pan what, what do the panelists see as perhaps the impact of refugee law jurisprudence and case law building um, with this disability uh, sensitive approach? Um, how it may impact on um, disability like domestic disability discrimination law and perhaps the rights of people with disability? Because um, I think of that example Stephanie gave earlier about segregated education, and that's of course a big area of advocacy um, from where I am in Australia. Uh, many um, children with disability still go to segregated schooling, and so if we're finding um, uh, through refugee status determination processes that people are um, able to gain protection on that ground of, as being serious harm. How do the panellists see um, cases like this in influencing how disability rights progress um, within our domestic jurisdictions? Uh, right, so that's a, that's an interesting question, is this, this uh, dis disabled people face horrendous discrimination practically everywhere in the world? Almost everywhere in the world, I would say. So, how do we how do we incorporate that? Um, would which one of our panelists would like to uh, respond? I maybe chip in. Well, that's a difficult question, but my my view is that anytime there is a development in an area of law, this development can actually have a domino effect. Uh, when it comes to inclusive education, uh, it's clear that uh, practices uh, across the globe are, are, are not consistent with the CRPD, although some scholars have said that Article 24 doesn't rule out completely some forms of uh, separate education, in particular for certain cohorts of persons with disabilities, but Article 24 makes it very, very clear that inclusive education should be the rule and should always be um, offered to children with disabilities that should have the same opportunities with, uh, without facing discrimination. And if this becomes, or, or, or the fact that, uh, you know, segregated education becomes to be considered when we interpret serious harm, may generate some evolution in, in the system, in other system, because clearly, um, in my opinion, there is the possibility to, uh, to use certain battles, so to speak, that are, um, uh, that occur in, 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 in areas that are some like, like refugee law and brings those back to advocate for the rights of persons with disabilities. Um, in terms of, of uh, education, but also in terms of health, which is another important area that Stephanie analyzes. Again, systems are, are, you know, are, are not consistent and not compliant to the CRPD when it comes to ensuring the right to health to people with disabilities on an equal basis with others. And if development of core in when it comes to asylum claims, those can have a knock-on effect uh, on, in, in, on, on the internal system and can reinforce advocacy claims when it comes to rights uh, of people with disabilities that live in that territory or are citizens of that 
state. That, that's my opinion, but that's always the case with drives. If we start, you know, the, the important thing is starting and advocating and, you know, change is, is never immediate. It requires time. And even the CRPD uh, recognize that rights are subject to progressive realization, which is not an alibi not to do anything, but it recognized that in some cases, changes may require time. And uh, it's important that, you know, all developments in all different areas of law are used to bring about that change in a consistent manner. So I'm not sure whether this answered fully your question, but that's, that's what I think. I think it, yeah, well, I think it's going some way towards uh, answering that question. It's, it takes a very long time to establish even a regional approach to a very difficult issue. So we see that in European Court all, all the time, European Court of Human Rights. Um, and so to establish a, a universal approach to segregated education, it will take a very, very, very long time. Um, there's, there's still disparities amongst uh, all, kinds of, um, all kinds of states that you wouldn't expect. There's awful lot of things going in, on in the chat as well at the moment, but we are at our time limit and um, our panelists have been trying to answer these questions, but we, we are now out of time. Um, would anyone of our panelists like to make any concluding comments? We, we have the flyer for the book in the chat. Um, and a discount as well. So I encourage you to, to buy the book and thank you all very much for attending today. Um, I encourage you to also keep an eye out for future Borders events. Um, the, there's obviously some coming up, I'm sure. And um, so thank you to our panelists. Congratulations to Dr. Motz and um, I hope to see you all again soon, perhaps even in person. So goodbye and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. See you later. So the, there's a lot of questions here in the chat. <laughs> kind of, it's getting incredibly complicated. Um, so, yeah. So, um, Great. Lovely to see you all.